you have your Bibles, I want to be inviting you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 as we conclude our series, Live the Prayer Today. And uh, you'll still notice some of our prayer stations from our 21 Days of Prayer, which also concludes today, uh, are up in the auditorium, and so I would encourage you to make use of those uh, before the close of today. Uh, You may have heard the story of uh, a middle school in Beaverton, Oregon, And uh, in this middle school, uh, there was a a problem that was ensuing in the girls' bathroom. I know there's a lot of problems that can ensue in a ladies' restroom, but this particular one was because of the middle school girls going in there, applying lipstick to their faces, and then kissing the mirror before they left. And so you had all these fresh lipstick marks all over the mirror. And so the principal would come over the intercom and say, ladies, You're welcome to apply your lipstick, but please do not kiss the mirror before you leave the restroom. Well, it continued. Uh, They did not hear or did not uh, obey what the principal was asking them to do. And so finally, the principal got fed up. And so he brought all the girls into the restroom, one class at a time. And he said, girls, I've told you, please do not kiss the mirror. I know you think it's cool, but please do not kiss the mirror before you leave the restroom after applying your lipstick. And he said, I I, I just can't tell you how hard it is to get this stuff off of the mirror. And so he said, I brought the custodian in to show you just how difficult it is to remove this lipstick from the mirror. And so he had the custodian uh, go and he had a squeegee and the custodian went Uh, to the commode and got the squeegee on the commode and got it wet and then came over and began to clean the mirror. (laughs) Needless to say, they didn't have any more problems with lipstick on the mirror. Some of you will get that halfway through the sermon. (laughs) But what if, as we close out this prayer today, if we could really see the invisible filth beyond our temptations? it would make a world of difference in how we deal with our temptations. So today we look at the final line of the prayer, but I want you to pray this prayer with me one more time. It'll be on the screen just from right where you are. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And the church said, Amen. So we've taken this prayer line by line the past few weeks, and we've looked at five lines already. We're going to look at the last two lines today. And we've said that these are not just words that we are to mouth to God. These are not just words that we are to to memorize. It's great if you've memorized this prayer. It's great if you've hidden it in your heart. But, But more than just words to be mouthed, These are values and passions to be lived, that we get to see this insight into Jesus' heart. I don't know about you, but when I I listen to people pray sometimes, you just get this insight into their heart. It's one of the reasons that uh, it's such a blessing to pray with with my wife, because you you just get to see kind of an insight into their heart when when you hear them pray. Uh, Same thing with my kiddos. And so we've we've looked at these lines, and we've said that, that there's something that we are to live in light of these passions of Jesus. And so you'll see on the screen here these these five things that we've already looked at. We said our our Father in heaven, that there's this relationship, this loving relationship, and so we're supposed to, 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 how do we live the love of God? Uh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Live the glory of God. Hallow your name in my life. Make your name great in my life, God. Make your name holy in, in my life. We live the glory of God. We also live the will of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we get to know God and as we get to know his will, as we get to know his word, uh, we are able to, to, to better discern what that, what that navigation plan looks like on how do we live the, the will of God and then live the care of God. Last week we looked at give us today our daily bread. And we said, you know, make sure you don't miss the, the possessive pronoun in there. Give us today our daily, not, not me, not my, not I, but give us today our daily bread, that, that when we live the care of God, that God's desire, God's strong desire is that, is that people have their daily sustenance, 
And so it's not just, it's not just enough for, for me to have mine, but how can I be a blessing to other people? How can I really live the prayer of give us today our daily bread? We said last week that God meets our needs so that we can meet his desires. And then lastly, uh, live the reconciliation of God. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I love you. You're forgiven. Supper's ready. Remember that from last week. Today as we we look at the, the last line of the prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I want you, if you're taking notes, to jot down uh, this kind of sixth line here, that, that part of, of living the passions of Jesus in this prayer is also to live the transformation of God. What, is it, what does it mean to live the transformation of God? And how in the world do you get that from this, this line, lead us not into temptation? Well, when I think about temptation, I think about temptation's potential to lead us into sin. And so when we, when we talk about living the transformation of God, uh, I think it's important for us to reflect on one of, one of these definitions of sin that you find is missing the mark. It's taken from the world of ancient archery, where when someone would miss the bullseye, it's this idea of missing the mark. And so it, it becomes a, an important question, well, what's the bullseye? We'll get to that in just a second. And it's interesting that as we get to this part of the prayer, and this is found as we've been reading in Matthew chapter 6, which is sandwiched kind of right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, these three chapters, the the longest recorded sermon that we have of Jesus in Scripture. But before Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there was Matthew chapter 4. Do you know what happened in Matthew chapter 4? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus goes through 40 days of temptation in the desert. And so before he's asking us, or before he's, he's giving us this example of praying, lead us not into temptation, Jesus has just gone through one of the most horrific periods of temptation, I believe, in all of Scripture. Forty days he's been tempted. And so he prays, lead us not into temptation. And it's not that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just walked out of this from Matthew chapter 4, and now he gets into the sermon and he, he prays this prayer. Lead us not into temptation. And the nature of temptation is to deter us from hitting the bullseye. So back to our question. What is the bullseye? I'm not going to beat around the bush this morning. I believe with all of my heart that the bullseye is Jesus. And that the bullseye for Homewood is that we are formed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the bullseye. Now, I've had, I had a lot of people give me other bullseye. No, you need to be focusing on the, no, you need to be, fo- we need to do, we, and those are all great. But the bullseye for our church, the bullseye really, I believe, for every church, is Jesus Christ and to be formed in his image. So if we're going to live the transformation, if you're going to live the prayer, then you're going to have to be weary, or wary, rather, of temptation. And so some of you Bible students out there are asking, well, doesn't James tell us that God does not tempt anyone in James 1 and 13? So why is Jesus teaching us to pray to God, lead us not into temptation? That's odd. Because James tells us that that God does not tempt anyone. Well, it may be helpful for us to go back and to look at kind of the language of the day, it may be helpful for us to go and and traffic with Matthew a little bit and and recognize that this word, this Greek word for temptation is this word parasmus, and it means a test or a trial, and whereas those are not exactly the same as temptation, it's often in the context of a test or a trial where I succumb to temptation. And one commentator says a better translation here would be, do not leave us, L-E-A-V-E, do not leave us in temptation, may be a better translation. But it does not mean to keep us out of it. But when we are in it, do not leave us there. And so in the context of a test or a trial, uh, we often, far too often, recognize 
the, tempta- the, off- the, the, the opportunity to, to succumb to temptation. So if a, if a student is in, has academic pressure, so if you, if you are, are having to make a certain grade and, and that pressure is on you, maybe that pressure is coming from your parents or maybe that pressure is coming from yourself. I've seen a lot of students that are really, really hard on themselves. But in the midst of that pressure, in the midst of that test or that trial, it, it, it's very opportunistic for us to, to do what? To succumb to temptation. Maybe, maybe we try to cheat on the exam. Maybe we try to cheat on the test or do anything that we, we have to do in order to, to get to that grade. Or maybe you're under financial pressure. And that pressure, that test, that trial that you, that you feel on you can, can make you succumb to uh, compromising your ethics or compromising your values. Uh, I've seen this dozens of times during my time uh, in the business world for a decade. Uh, you've seen it too. Maybe you have been a part of that. Uh, you, you see this when you're under relationship pressure. Maybe your marriage is struggling and you, and you can be susceptible to, to seeking love and, and attention in the arms of another man or woman. Uh, I remember growing up, my, my preacher had uh, two rules for, for those uh, in, in like a dating relationship. So it's not, not just for those who are married, but all, maybe, maybe you're in a dating. Or, but, but he would say two rules. He'd say number one is the reclining rule, and number two was the swimsuit rule. And the reclining rule was that the further that you reclined with someone that you are, are dating with, the, the more susceptible you were to temptation. So, so Lenny and I would go on dates like, just straight up, we just, well, you know, no, no reclining whatsoever, right? Because the further you, you recline, the more you're susceptible to temptation, to compromising purity. Uh, the swimsuit rule that he would often give us was that uh, you do not need to be touching anyone in an area that's covered by their swimsuit, anyone that's not your spouse. And so I had the reclining rule in my mind. I had the swimsuit rule in my mind going, going all, all, often. And, and, and you, just, you see the, this, this nature that even in the midst of test and trials, and the last one is when you're under social pressure. And whether or not your peers accept you being dependent on you this can compromise, the social pressure can often compromise. I think you get the point. But the bottom line is this, is that it's, it's the environment of a trial that I become most susceptible to temptation. It's interesting, the proverb writer writes, if you want to flip over to Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 and 9, listen, listen to this interesting insight. The, the proverb writer says, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise... I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and still and so dishonor the name of my God. I think it's interesting because the proverb writer acknowledges that tests and trials, temptation, does not just come in our adversity. Do you know that prosperity can be a test or a trial? Oftentimes we say, no, 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 prosperity is, is, a, is a blessing. It's a blessing that, that we're to steward. Yes, that's true. But it can also, according to the proverb writer, it can also be a test and a trial. Give me neither poverty nor riches, he said. Because he realizes that even in the midst of, of that, I can be tempted to think, well, why do I need God? Who, who is the Lord? I've got everything I need right here. And in praying, lead us not into temptation, you're expressing your willingness to be on the lookout for temptation, and you're also expressing your vulnerability in temptation. And my friends, this is a humbling prayer to pray. Uh, You may be here today and thinking, well, preacher, that's that's good and well, but you're you're too late, (laughs) because I'm already in the midst of a test or a trial. I'm already in the midst of one, so... So I, I don't need to, to pray this already because I'm already in one. And I just want to ask, I just want to offer you a pastoral word this morning. Two things. I want to encourage you to jot these things down and reflect on them as well. I'm going to give you some scriptures to, to meditate on as well. But the first one is this, is that tests and trials can be used to protect us from pride. What I mean. The, the Apostle Paul had an incredible conversion story. I mean, this was the guy Saul. 
Saul who was uh, converted, uh, the killer of Christians that was converted, and he went on to, to travel and preach all over the world. He also went on to write half of what we know as our New Testament now. And so if anybody had a reason to be able to pat himself on the back, who was it? It was Paul. I mean, if anybody could say, yeah, look, look, at all, look where I've come from, and look what I've done, and, and all this, it was Paul. But, but look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. Paul says this, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, did you catch that? In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. But when I am weak, then I am strong. Now you're not told, you and I aren't told what this thorn is in Paul's flesh, but we are told its origin. What's the origin of Paul's thorn? The origin is it was a messenger of Satan and it was tormenting him. And Paul says, looking back in the rearview mirror, this was to keep me from becoming what? Conceited. I think I've mentioned you before that that word ego, E-G-O, can be best described by by just giving an acronym to every one of those letters, E-G-O, edging God out. That's what ego is. And when we edge God out, slowly but surely, there are times when these trials and tests can be used In a redemptive way, however, to keep me from edging God out so that I remain dependent on Him. There's another one in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. I want you to jot down Hebrews 2.10 and look at this. For it was fitting that He, God, from whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation, Jesus, get this perfect through suffering. I don't think it's on the screen, but he goes on to say in verse 17, For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. And he is able to help those who are being tempted. Write this down, number two, that tests and trials can be used to perfect us for ministry to others. Tests and trials can be used to protect us but they can also be used to perfect us for ministry to other people. Do you remember what Jesus told Peter in Luke chapter 22? He says, Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail you. And when you have turned back, when you have turned back, what? When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. These tests and trials, they, 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 they can be used to protect us from pride, but they can also be used to perfect us in ministry to others. You pray not to be led into tests, trials, and temptations, as we should. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. But when you find yourself in those environments... You must know that God has a track record to use such things to perfect us for ministry to others. Uh, It's a weird illustration, I know, and it's one that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, but I think about it often just to to give me a context. And and it's it's an illustration of snake venom. Um, Snake venom can be very deadly, depending on you know, which which snake venom especially you get exposed to. But snake venom can also save lives. It's called antivenom, but you need snake venom in order to produce antivenom. Even though the, the head of a snake is cut off, 
and, th and this is, I, I, I came across this this week, folks who went rattlesnake hunting. I don't know why you go rattlesnake hunting, but some people do it. They go rattlesnake hunting. Cut off the head of the rattlesnake. And, and, and what do they tell you? They say, hey, you leave that head alone for a little bit. Because <laughs> even though it's been detached, even though it's been severed from the body, it's, it still is venomous and can strike. And so, I mean, if you want to, if you want to do some a crazy exercise, just go and, and, and search some of this stuff on YouTube. I mean, it, it, you see a, a, a detached head still, still alive and, and striking people. I mean, it, it just blows your mind. But I think this, this illustration is, is, is helpful uh, for us, for me, because it all depends on who it's coming from and whose hands it's in. Amen? The enemy, the enemy is a snake. And I want to stay out of environments that enable him to get a hold of me. But when I'm in those environments, God can still redeem the venom and use it as an antivenom to give others in the future. And so living the prayer involves this, this passion to live the transformation of God, to be transformed. But it also involves this passion. This is the last thing. This is what we're going to close out on is to live the deliverance of God. Lead, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. And notice what Jesus says. Jesus does not say, deliver us from evil. Jesus says, deliver us from the evil one. And I think it's very interesting and appropriate that we look at the first line of the prayer and the last line of the prayer our father in heaven and in the last line of the prayer deliver deliver us from the evil one and we, we see even in the context of this prayer that there, there are worlds going on that, that that we can't see there are worlds that are happening outside of, of the realm of the world that we are in right now you have a father who's in heaven, and you have an evil one. And the problem of, of evil oftentimes is rooted in the fact that we haven't put a D on the front of evil yet. <laughs> put a D on evil, and what you get? You get devil or devil. Barna did some research and came out with this finding that 60% of Protestant Christians do not believe that the devil is an actual being, that he's, he's just a symbol. Four out of ten millennials believe this. One of Satan's greatest schemes is to convince us that he doesn't exist. Jesus goes straight to the heart of all opposition to God and all opposition to life in his kingdom when he prays, deliver us from the evil one. And the question becomes, well, well if Jesus has already de defeated the enemy on the cross and through his resurrection, then why do we still need deliverance? And my friends, the enemy has lost the war, but he's still picking battles. And think about that snake. That head can still transmit venom even when it's detached. And through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the head has been severed, but he can still deliver some poison. And so, church, we allow the poison to eat away at our lives. And I believe one of the primary ways that we allow the poison to eat away at our lives is through Satan's lies. In Operation Iraqi Freedom, Several years ago, you, you may remember this going on, but in, in Baghdad, there was, there was all of this communication coming out from this uh, communication guy that, that was present there, and his name was Al Sahaf. And he was saying, well, the, the American troops aren't even here. They've been detained. They're, they're not, and and all, the, all the while, you're seeing on CN, CNN, the airport in Baghdad being, uh, being besieged. You see Saddam... Hussein's palace being overrun, and he's still coming out as, as this communicator saying, no, 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 everything's fine, you know, everything's fine. He became known in that time as, as Baghdad Bop. 
he was just spreading these these lies to try to make people think, no, no, everything's okay, everything's all right, don't worry about it. My friends, I, I looked at that this week and was reminded the only power the enemy has is the power we give him when we live in light of his lies. And that's why our deliverance is found in the truth. And the truth has a name, and the truth's name is Jesus Christ. And his name means salvation. The Lord saves. That's what the name Jesus means. That salvation is found in no other name than the name of Jesus. And so often we believe the lies of the enemy. You're not good enough. You never were. I can't tell you how many people have, after I did this illustration with the the praise team a few weeks ago, where one started a, a comment, and then the other started, and the other started, and the other started, and they all came in to, to all these things that feed into our, our minds and all these lies that we hear. And I've had some of you tell me, you know what, that's true, and, and it's very devastating, but you know what, the opposite is also true. That when we are, are feeding our, our minds with the Word of God, when we are feeding our minds with His truth, when we are feeding our minds with the truth of Jesus Christ, that that also feeds us and compels us. And to that we say, Amen. I want to close with this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and read this as we close, and then we'll sing a song. Paul says, and we'll read this together, For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word that it reminds us who we are, reminds us whose we are. God, we do want to be a people that live your deliverance. We thank you for this prayer, this prayer of Jesus that we've looked at the past few weeks. Father, I pray that we embody that prayer, that we live its passions, that we live its values, that we don't just mouth its words. God, I pray that this becomes our language, that it becomes who we are as we live out the life founded in you. God, I pray for those that are in the midst of a test or a trial right now, in this moment. God, I pray that you will send, uh, Father, your peace, that you'll surround them with your angels, God, that you will uh, allow them to recognize just the power that is found in the presence of your Holy Spirit. And God, that that spirit will continue to comfort, continue to convict, Uh, Father, continue to to be our teacher, our great counselor. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity, the freedom that we have to open it in this room, uh, to share it freely. And Father, may we not just share it, may we walk out these doors and live by it. God, thank you for your grace. It truly is sufficient. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. We'll have a shepherd down front, and we'll also have a shepherd and his wife back here in the chapel. If you have a need this morning, if today's the day that you want to give your life to Christ and to be baptized in him, we'd love to celebrate that with you. Come as we sing this song. Make me more free.
we're glad that you're with us today, and we hope that you have enjoyed our time together.